Thank you, Trimus. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our presentation for tonight on breast ultrasound, scanning tips, and common pathology. So as Trimus said, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. As such, we have been receiving more ultrasound requests for the breast, both male and female. I will discuss patient preparation, anatomy, scanning technique, and common pathology for the breast. Okay, so patient preparation, the details can vary per department, depending on if it's a group examination or not. But generally, an explanation of the examination is given to the patient. You ask them not to wear roll-on on the day of the scan, as some deodorants, when mixed with ultrasound gel, can form a paste that is not easy to clean from the probe. And it reduces the coupling effect of the ultrasound gel. The patient should also be asked to wear clothes that can be easily slipped off on the day of the examination, or the department can provide a changing gown for them. In the case of female breast ultrasound examinations, it is considered an intimate examination. Where there is a male sonographer or technician, the patient should be offered a female chaperone. All right. Now we move on to a general overview of the anatomy. So we'll start with um, the anatomy of the female breast. It is important to show up to the level of the ribs on your ultrasound scan. So you should appreciate that deep to the breast are the ribs. And after that is the pectoralis um, muscle layer. Within the breast, you start to see the fat, the fatty part of the breast the adipose tissue in the breast, then the lobules, all right, the lobules, the lobules are where the milk is produced and then it's transported through the ducts to the nipple. Okay, so surface anatomy is also important. We have the skin of the breast, the nipple, the areola, all right. Then to discuss the anatomy of the male breast, it's basically the same, except that in the male breast, there are no lobules that make the milk, and it's obviously smaller. Um, there is a normal variant that I would like to discuss, which is a common variant actually. This is the tail of the breast. This is when you see a uh, breast tissue extending all the way into the axilla. It's also important to look at the axilla for this axillary process. So every time that we do breast scans, we also look at the axilla. It is a common variant to not think that your patient is abnormal if they've got glandular tissue in the axilla. All right, we also want to look at um, the lymphatic drainage of the breast. Um, lymph drains from the breast to the intramammary nodes, to the supraclavicular nodes, the infraclavicular nodes, and the axillary nodes. So it is important to note that in the intramammary pathway, they can connect between the two breasts. It is important to note this, that is um, infection can move through this connection from one breast to the other breast and malignancy as well can move through this lymph pathway from one breast to the other breast. That is why we always look at both breasts when we are doing an examination of the breast. All right, now to move on to equipment selection. It's important to choose the breast probe, depending on the type of thickness of the breast that you're going to be doing. You know, some breasts are bigger, some are smaller, some are male breasts. So there is um, 
uh, and important for the type of frequency that you're going to choose. Generally, the range is seven to 12 megahertz, depending on the type of penetration that you need. As increased frequency gives you better near resolution, but reduced frequency gives you better depth resolution, better penetration. All right. Now we'll move on to positioning. The patient is positioned in such a way as to minimize breast thickness. And the best position for that is supine with the ipsilateral arm abducted and hand beneath the head. All right, so for example, if we're going to look at the left breast, like in the picture there, we'll ask the patient to put their left hand under the head so we can get a clear view of the left breast and axilla. So we're using the nipple as the center of our clock face, making sure that our nipple is facing the ceiling and it is right at the center there. We then use the clock face to localize any lesions that we see on ultrasound. This is important to make sure that our images are reproducible. If this patient goes for a mammal after our scan, they should be able to localize the lesion in the same way that you localized it because you used a universal clock face. All right. Now to talk about technique. Uh, there are many uh, forms of technique that can be used for the breast. The most common ones are the radial and the anti-radial um, technique. This is we make sure that we look at the breast in two planes, two planes that are perpendicular to each other, whichever technique you're going to use, right? So in the radial, you use the probe um, clockwise, closer to the nipple and in the sub areola region, scanning right through clockwise, then you go to the next scan uh, on the outer surface of the breast, scanning clockwise again. So this is in one plane. Then the other plane that will be perpendicular to that will be the anteradial plane. This is moving from the outer surface of the breast, coming to the nipple. Then you move down from the outer surface of the breast, coming to the nipple, making sure that you assess the entire parenchyma of the breast. The other method that is also common is the meander method. With this method, you can start in sagittal with your probe in sagittal section. Then you move from the medial part of the breast to the lateral part, go down, and from the lateral part to the medial part of the breast until you cover the entire breast parenchyma. Then the other plane that will be perpendicular to that is um, with your probe in transverse going from up to down, moving to the next section, from down to up. I hope you can appreciate those two types of uh, scanning techniques. All right, another form of technique that we can use is echopalpation. This is the localizing of a lump with two of your fingers with one hand. This is the non-scanning hand. Then you localize the lump using your fingers then with the other scanning hand, you scan right on top of the lamp so that you make sure that you are seeing how this lamp appears on ultrasound. This technique also allows you to feel if the lamp is mobile as benign lamps are mobile while malignant lamps are stiffer and will not move easily. All right, just to add on to echopalpation, the patient can also point to you where the lesion is, and then you can scan right over where the patient is pointing. Then we have an old technique called Tremitas. This is the use of Doppler to assess if an isoechoid section of the breast has a lesion. The patient may be asked to harm while the power Doppler is on. A focal lesion will not show uh, the color artifact, while normal breast tissue will show a color artifact. So in this case, where the arrow is pointing on A, we are suspecting that there's an isoechoic lesion there. We ask the patient to harm, and we turn on the Doppler, and you can see that on B there, this lesion is not um, 
showing the Doppler artifact. So there's definitely a lesion going on there. But this is an old method, which has since been replaced by elastography. Elastography is a dynamic method used to characterize known lesions. It uses the principle that benign lesions are compressible, while malignant lesions are stiffer and less compressible, that is, they are less elastic. And you will need specialized elastography software to be able to use this technique. We move on to the use of a standoff. Um, you can use either gel as a standoff, or you can use commercialized available pads um, that will be containing gel inside them to put them right on top of the breast. This is for better visualization of superficial masses. For example, if you're seeing a node uh, right under the skin or on the skin, you can put your stand of gel right on top of that node and scan over so you can better appreciate it. In this example, we've got something going on here just deep to the skin. And after the use of a stand of gel on the right side, we can see it better and better appreciated on ultrasound. So these are some of the tips that you can use when you're scanning the breast. Especially important for looking at nipple lesions, because you know the nipple, as we said, is a superficial part of the breast. You can use a standoff over the nipple, then do your ultrasound scan uh, right on top of the standoff so you can better appreciate uh, the nipple lesion. All right. We're moving on to the different types of common pathology that you can find on ultrasound scan. So first of all, I want to discuss benign features against malignant features. We are saying that if you find a lesion on ultrasound, it is important to characterize whether this lesion could be benign or it could have some malignant features. So with benign lesions, they usually have a wider than deep shape. We're saying the transverse diameter will be less than the AP diameter. And this lesion has a 99% uh, chance of being benign. If the lesion is well circumscribed with hyperechoic tissue, it has an approximately 100% chance of being benign. If the lesion is gently curving, with smooth, smooth lobulations, that is the margin is gently curving and it's got smooth lobulations in a wider than deep lesion, it has a 99% chance of being benign. If the lesion has got thin echogenic pseudocapsule with a wider than deep nodule, in a wider than deep nodule, it has got 99% again, a uh, percent chance of being benign. So the capsule is representing normal compressed breast tissue consistent with something that is not infiltrating into uh, the breast tissue. So those are the nine features. The malignant features would be the opposite of some of these benign features. If the lesion is taller than wider, that is if the AP diameter is so much greater than the transverse than the diameter. And if there is sonographic speculation, that means uh, alternate hyperechoic to hyperechoic lines radiating perpendicularly from the surface of the nodule. If it has got microlobulations, that is very small lobulations around the surface of uh, the lesion, chances are very high, 75% high that it is malignant. Angular margins, that is, if the margins are very sharp, it has got a 70% chance of being malignant. If it is markedly hypoechoic, like the lesion is very dark and very hypoechoic, it also has a 70% chance of being malignant. If there is sonographic posterior acoustic shadowing, the lesion has got a 50% chance of being malignant. 
if it has a branch leaf pattern, it has a 30% chance of being malignant. If there are, if there are punctured calcifications, it has a 25% chance of being malignant. If the calcifications will not have a shadowing, and then there's the issue of compressibility again. In general terms, benign lesions compress with transistor pressure, and malignant lesions are stiffer, as we said before. This is the principle of elastography. All right, then we'd also like to look at um, the common pathology that you can find on breast ultrasound. Uh, one of those is the cysts. Breast cysts are very common, especially in younger ladies. A cyst will have clear anechoic contents and a thin capsule, as seen in the diagrams on the screen. I'm sure we're all common with cysts. So we are, we're all familiar with cysts. As we move on to fibroadenomas, fibroadenomas um, can have a more hypochoric or even heterogeneous uh, composition. And most of the time, they will have smooth margins or smoothly lobulated margins. Most fibroadenomas do not demonstrate um, significant perfusion on color doctor evaluation. And as you can see in this picture, the fibroadenomas seem to sit well in the uh, breast tissue. It's not invading into the breast tissue. Let's say. Pyloid tumor, but this is another type of benign tumor that has got a rather lobulated outline, but as you can see, there are smooth lobulations. It can be uh, heterogeneous or hypochoric in texture. It can have necrotic changes depending on how long the tumor has been in the body. As you can see there, there are cystic portions of that uh, pyloid tumor, and it can also have some uh, Interlesion perfusion. And then there's a more malignant type of lesion like the ductal carcinoma. With ductal carcinomas, um, it is a lesion that will be located within the ducts of the breast. As you can see with these lesions on the screen, they are closer to the skin, uh, they are not as deep as some lesions could be. So that's in how we know that this is more in the gut of the breast than in the deeper tissue that gives us its name, the uh, ductal carcinoma. The lesion on the left is demonstrating shadowing. It's also demonstrating angular margins. The lesion on the right also has some sharp angular margins and it is seen to be taller than it is wider. Moving on to lobular carcinoma. Uh, this is just malignancy that is, low, that is positioned within the lobes of the breast. So we're saying it's going to be deeper in the breast uh, within the lobules. As you can see on this, on this screen, this lesion, this hypochoric lesion is deeper in the breast than the previous screen. And then there is another common feature that you can find in ultrasound, uh, breast implants. Um, an implant will have an obviously foreign body looking sort of capsule as seen in the diagram. And uh, it's quite common to find a bit of fluid collecting around the capsule. A little bit of fluid is, is normal, but when the fluid becomes extensive, then you will start um, suspecting uh, an inflammatory response to the implant. Then there are cases of mastitis. With mastitis, which means inflammation of the breast, we can see uh, different presentations. In this example, we've got uh, dilated ducts or ductectasia, as some may call it. We can see that the breast ducts are very prominent. 
if you turn your probe round into longitude now, maybe your foot is in transverse and it just looks like a circular structure. If you elongate the probe, you'll see that it is long. And if you put color Doppler on it, you will see that it does not take up much color. So it's not a vessel uh, per se, but it is a dilated duct. And we say that a duct is dilated if it's more than 2.5 centimeters, sorry, 2.5 millimeters. So in the case that you find dilated ducts um, in both breasts, that is a very high that that patient is suffering from mastitis. We're moving on to another feature of mastitis, which is an abscess in the breast. So here on the left, we can see um, a thick walled lesion that has got, when, when you're doing this examination dynamically, you can actually appreciate the fluids that should be moving inside the lesion. Um, sometimes it can be thick with internal echoes, sometimes it can be clear, but as long as the, the lining, the, the margin of the abscess is thick like that, we suspect an abscess. In the right side, if you turn on the color Doppler, there will be hyperemia around this abscess. Obviously, the inside of the lesion is not picking up color because that is probably pus or fluid, and that doesn't have any, any blood vessels running through it. But around the lesion, because of that inflammatory response, there will be hyperemia around abscesses. All right, uh, there's also the issue of fluid collection, taking us back to the slide of the implant, showing uh, some fluid collection there. So sometimes we can just appreciate fluid collecting in the breast, then we start to query mastitis again. Moving on to gynecomastia. Gynecomastia is overdevelopment of the breast tissue in men or boys due to hormonal reasons or reaction to certain medication. Also, some can demonstrate often a sub areolar hypochoric lesion with an anechoic star shaped posterior border, which can be described as finger like projections or spider legs, insinuating into the surrounding echogenic fibrous breast tissue. So, these are some of the common pathology that you can come across when you're doing an uh, ultrasound examination of the breast. I tried my best to summarize um, the scanning tips and different pathology that you can come across when you are practicing ultrasound. So basically, this is what everyone who is practicing breast ultrasound should have a general overview of. I'd like to give my acknowledgments to this particular website, which is where I got my referrals, especially for benign versus malignant features of the breast lesions. Thank you very much. I'm handing back over to Trinus. Thank you so much, Mrs. Verenga, for a wonderful presentation on the on breast ultrasound. Uh, we don't want to dwell much um, into summarizing what we have already summarized. In the meantime, we're just going to get into question and answer time. So for all those with questions, we kindly ask you to raise your hands or maybe type in the chat box if you're not comfortable saying them out. So that Mrs. Verenga and anyone else here who is doing breast ultrasound can help in this question and answer section. Thank you. So all those with questions, please feel free to unmute your mics to raise your hand, hands.
the house is too quiet. Anyone with questions or any clarification, any hostile reaction, please feel free. We have a raised hand, uh, Daliso. Can you unmute, un unmute your mic and ask your question? Well, mine is not a question. Are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, all right. I joined in a bit late, but um, I, mine is some sort of um, a comment, not really from the presentation, but the whole issue of uh, breast ultrasound. Uh, um, I'm still a novice in the field of radiology, but um, I am of a view that uh, us being key players in diagnosis of uh, various breast pathologies in this month of October, I think um, later on in future with the leaders that are on the platform, I feel we should um, continue re-emphasizing the aspect of uh, how important uh, breast diagnosis is very important, more at an early stage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for such an emphasis on the role of sonographers in the imaging of the breast, especially in the early diagnosis of breast cancer, because most of the times our patients present later when the, um, the cancer is already at stage three or stage four. However, it's important uh, even in our centers or in, in our various departments to always have some kind of an awareness program to educate uh, the women in the community on uh, regular checkups of the breasts. So um, make sure we do justice whenever we do the, uh, the scanning of the breasts, never to miss any lesions because we play a very important role in the diagnosis of breast cancer. Thank you. Anyone with more questions? Any questions from the audience? Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Mr. Kindman is asking, uh, did I miss some slides on the axilla and in particular appearance of axillary lymph nodes with reference to the benign and malignant pathologies we can find in the breast? Uh, Mrs. Verenga. Yes, um, we did not miss any slides. I did not put any in detail. But when it comes to the technique for the axilla, um, it's obviously in transverse and sagittal plane. And also appreciating that the lymph nodes, if you find any enlarged lymph nodes in the axilla, should have maintained um, a hyperechoic hilum and a hypoechoic periphery and should not be greater in size than normal lymph nodes. Um, I feel that uh, when it comes to lymphadenopathy, it is an extensive um, topic on its own uh, that we need even more time to discuss it. But yes, it is important when you're doing the breast ultrasound to be able to differentiate normal lymph nodes from abnormal lymph nodes, reactive lymph nodes from malignant lymph nodes. Did I answer the question? Mr. Kindman, uh, question answered. Hello.
I assume his answer is responded in the chat box. Any more questions? There was uh, someone who wanted to ask a question. Please go on. It, it's not a question. I was just thanking Christine for a well articulated uh, uh, talk about breasts. And I just want to appreciate the fact that uh, this is the breast. Uh, October is a breast cancer month or awareness. And uh, I like the fact that uh, we have brought it on board at this time. And I want to just uh, say that it's very, very important, especially to have this thing um, detected a little bit early so that you either don't lose the breast or uh, you don't go, uh, the patient doesn't go to those extents of radiotherapy and all those things. Um, I just wanted to put in a little bit of, uh, of, of some mm -hmm. meat into the lecture. Uh, when would a patient come to do a breast scan, especially in lactating mothers, when is it um, at the right time to do it? Thank you. Uh, I think that question can be answered by when the patient is symptomatic within the breast and in lactating mothers, they, they are quite prone to mastitis since uh, they're mm -hmm. constantly Yes, they're constantly uh, breastfeeding their babies. And sometimes bacteria can move from the mouth of the baby to the mother, and they are prone to mastitis. So I think that question could be answered by saying that when, when she's got symptoms, when she's feeling pain, when she's feeling engorged, she can come through for the breast ultrasound. And uh, most of the cases, we do find inflammatory responses within the breast. We also do find... Um, um, extremely dilated ducts in some cases of mastitis in lactating mothers. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. We have another uh, hand raised. Please, you can go on. Someone who's raising, uh, they don't have a name uh, to, to them. Uh, can you please ask? Any more questions? Comments, editions. Uh, while we are waiting for some others who still may be formulating their questions, uh, question, Mrs. Verenga, on. Uh, fibrocystic changes of the breast, can we link those to possibility of uh, maybe malignancy? Yes, literature does say that um, some fibrocystic lesions can become malignant, but the chances are very low. Some even say 3% chance of malignancy if the lesion is not treated early. Though I haven't come across one personally that ends up being uh, cancerous. Okay, then there's another question uh, I've noticed in the WhatsApp group uh, on like the difference between a fibroadenoma and a phyllode tumor. So, 
all right. So from the features that we discussed um, during the presentation, we did say that um, uh, fiber adenoma has got a more homogeneous echo pattern, while at least uh, the phyllos tumors are more prone to necrotic changes. And phyllos tumors have got a more lobulated outline. And I've also noticed in practice, uh, it is okay to research on this, but with phyllos tumors, you do find um, intralesion confusion less than you do with fibroadenomas. With fibroadenomas, uh, you usually see more of peripheral perfusion. Uh, so I can say basically those are some of the differences that you find in these tumors. If anyone has anything to add? Hi. Please go on. Please go on. Yes, I wanted to find out, like, in an event you have a patient uh, with congenital anomaly of the breast, like, how do you go about it? Example, uh, like, somebody has um, accessory, what do you call this? Accessory nipples, like, they have accessory nipples, or they have hypoplastic nipples, like, how are you going to scan? Because you mentioned earlier to say, we use the nipple as our reference uh, when we're scanning. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Um, I'm sure in the case of accessory nipples, as you said, accessory, there will be one that will be the proper nipple, the primary nipple. So that one is the one that's used as the, the center of the breast. And in cases where there is um, hypoplastic nipple, um, you just then place the clock face on your breast as the patient is lying supine. So it's like an improvision of technique, as long as the technique you use can be reproduced in, in, in the next clinical setting. That's my take on that one. 